Hey, it's the Pastor Jerry at Crestview Wesleyan in Ashboro, North Carolina. I want to thank you for joining us for the online service today. Hey, I'm in a different location today. There's some stuff going on at the church, so I'm re recording over here at the house. But man, it's good to be back. We've had some wonderful things happen at our church the last couple of weeks, celebrating our treasurer of 25 years, who's just a phenomenal lady. And last week we had a lady, Debbie, that's part of our church that that she preached last Sunday and did an incredible job. So I'm back today, and today I'm going back into Mark chapter 15, the, the death of Jesus. And those of you who followed me just understood that, man, there's at the death of Jesus, there's a lot going on. Because there's, first of all, in verse 33 of Mark chapter 15, there's this d divine darkness that goes on. It says from noon to three that it is just complete darkness. And, and while all that's going on, Jesus is, as he is near death, right at three o'clock, when he is near death, he cries out in Aramaic, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And people hear this word and, and this, my God, translated, translated into Aramaic is Eloi. And so people misunderstand, says, wait a minute, he's calling Elijah. And they're looking all around trying to find Elijah and and trying to keep Jesus alive so maybe Elijah can show up. And then right when Jesus died, uh, it talks about that the curtain that separated the holy from the holy of holies, from the presence of God in the temple, it was torn from top to bottom. So man, there was, there was a lot of signs going on, a lot of things going on. And you know, the people around this crucifixion scene are just like us, it, that we get distracted, that we're looking around, that we're looking for signs, that we're looking for everything else. But you know, I think other than the death of Jesus, the death of Jesus obviously is the most important, most critical thing. But, but I believe one of the things is overlooked that is not nearly talked about is one of the last things that happens. It says that the centurion was standing right in front of Jesus as he died, and when he died, he said this, Surely, this is the Son of God. So, again, think about this. A centurion. This is an enemy of the Jews. He's a Gentile. He is the enemy of Jesus. He is the guy that is responsible for doing crucifixions. He's got a team of a hundred soldiers that he does the crucifixion. If you are a betting man, you would put a lot of your money on that if there was anybody that would correctly identify Jesus, this would not be the guy. You would you would feel like, you know what, I'm gonna make a lot of money saying this wouldn't be the guy to do it. But but he is the one who correctly identified Jesus. So Again, think about this. Here is this guy that he he got it. Everybody else was distracted. Everybody else was looking at the darkness, uh, trying to figure out, looking for Elijah, that are noticing the, the curtain is, is torn into. All, all of these things going on. But there was one guy, the centurion, the, the, the first human in all of history that correctly, perfectly identified who Jesus was and what his calling was. Well, there's some of you that's probably saying, wait a minute, Jerry, you're wrong on this because remember Peter, that when Jesus asked him a little bit earlier in the, in the story, in, in the Gospel of Mark, when, when he when Jesus asked Peter or asked him, who do, you, who do you say I am? Remember, Peter said, well, you are the Messiah. Well, the Messiah, it, it, the Spirit of God told him this, but it wasn't the true complete picture. Think about this, because the Messiah and the Son of God, even though they're similar, there's a little bit more to Son of God. Look at this here. I mean, when, when you think about Messiah, you, you think about... The definition really is the anointed king by God that rescues people and establishes the kingdom. 
So a Messiah is a, is a political and national figure, kind of like a King David. But the Son of God, it encompasses the Messiah, but it also includes his uh, suffering role. See him as a suffering servant. So again, everybody else was distracted. Everybody else was looking everywhere else. But this one guy, this centurion, this one that, that you would think would be the last person that would ever get it right was the one who got it right. So guys, I just want to say this. I said this a couple of weeks ago, and this is so critical. It's one of the most important statements. When I think about this, one of the most important statements as a Christian that we need to get, and we learn it from this centurion. Look at this. It's only at the cross where one completely and adequately and correctly recognizes who Jesus is, the Son of God. See, it's at the cross, when we are at the cross, spiritually at the cross, when we understand who Jesus is and where he died at and what he did for us, that's when we truly understand this, that's where true confession comes in. That's where true faith comes in, where it is, it is started, it begins, true faith begins, and it's also where true faith is sustained in your life. When you go, when you see Jesus, when you look at him at the cross, spiritually, that's where he's correctly identified. Jesus, even though we read stories about his ministry, about his preaching, about his teaching, about his miracles, about all of these things, we can learn some things about Jesus and identify Jesus to a certain point. But where we truly understand and truly understand the true identity of Jesus is at the cross. That's where we get it. And it, I mean, what people tell us about Jesus, where if we mix politics and Jesus together, politics and religion, I heard somebody tell me this, that if you mix politics and religion, it always equals politics. So, so where we truly find out where Jesus is, is exactly the same place where the centurion was. And he was the first human to truly correctly identify who Jesus was. So there's one last point before I move on, because there's some good stuff here. At the end of the death of Jesus, there's a couple of verses I want to go through today. But this last point, speaking about the death, speaking about the crucifixion, speaking about the whole process, about Jesus going to the cross and dying for us, is his, his death is, is not a tragic end. It's not a, a spinning out of control, helpless situation for Jesus. I mean, this was a divinely ordained event, series of events that Jesus welcomed, that Jesus knew his mission and purpose and followed through all the way God's plan for his life. He did that. This was, this was no like chaotic event where... He, he didn't know what was going on. He didn't know how it was going to happen. I mean, three times Jesus talked about, prophesied in Scripture. He predicted. He said, you know what? I'm going to die, and this is the way it's going to die, and it's going to be a grueling death. And these things, exactly what he predicted, exactly came true. He knew what was going on, and, and he knew that it was because it had to be from Jesus because he was the only, he's the Son of God. He was the one with the perfect blood. He was the one that could take on our condemnation. He, could, he was the only one that through his death, through his blood shed, through taking on all of our sin, we, could, we can now be right before God. In our church, this is just one of the verses that we talk about all the time. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, it says, God who made him with no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. That's simply saying again, we're, we're the ones who should be condemned. We are the sinners. 
It, it comes from the very beginning. Sin, we're, we're, we've got this infected by sin. We're all born infected by sin. Jesus never had that. He, he was pure, sin-free. He's the Son of God. But He came and He took on all of our sin. He became sin. And because He took on all of our sin, He gave us His righteousness when we accept what He did, when we see Him there as a suffering servant on the cross. And because of that, we can now have that right relationship. We can have that we can be we can be considered right holy before god guys guys just think about that it's only through jesus so let, let's move on here today because there's there's an important last little verses couple of verses about the death of jesus that is that, that i just love i just love it and, and again, it's another thing we think about. When we think about the death of Jesus, we think about the crucifixion, there's a lot of things that comes to our mind, but some things we tend to just bypass or tend to just float right past it. And that's why I love going verse by verse and love going through the Gospel of Mark is, man, we can spend some time with it and understand what this really means. But, but here at the, at the cross, there were a few people watching the crucifixion. And we read about them starting in verse 40 of Mark chapter 15. It says, Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to, Jesus, to Jerusalem were also there. So, this month... September is a month that, that our denomination, our Wesleyan denomination, has set aside to, to champion women, to, to think women. And, and one of the, the things, initiatives that we're doing is, is, is trying to get women to, to come into our pulpits and preach. Next Sunday, we're going to have a, a lady, an anointed lady, to come and preach. She, she has preached here before and Man, the, the, our folks just loved her, and she's coming again. We had Debbie last week to preach, and and, and I, I just the thing that I love about our denomination is is we are doing what Jesus talks about when it comes to speaking about women. First of all, just think about it. I mean, Paul talks about this in Galatians chapter three. He says there's no Jew or Greek, there's no uh, slave or free. There's no male or female. That we are all one in Christ. And Jesus, if you read through the Gospel of Mark, I've talked about this as I've gone. I mean, Jesus just gave women, uh, several women, some of the highest acclaim in all of Scripture. Let me just go a few of them, through a few of them, so, so you'll get it and go, oh yeah, oh yeah, I didn't think about that. Uh, look at this here. I mean, in Mark chapter 5, here was this woman with the issue of blood, and, and she chased Jesus down. And it says in, in verse 34, Jesus told her, Daughter, your faith has healed her. And, and remember in Mark chapter 7, there was this Gentile woman that her daughter was possessed by a demon. And, and she was the one, it seemed like Jesus gave her a hard time, but Jesus was just finding out if she's real or not. And in Matthew's gospel, it says, woman, you have great faith. Think about this in Mark chapter 12 about this lady who, who had uh, her last two cents, this poor widow. And Jesus commended her saying she put more in the treasury than these rich folks who put in a bunch of money. She gave all she had. And then we think about in, in Mark chapter 14 that there was this lady who who broke this very expensive bottle of perfume to anoint Jesus' body for death. So we think about these stories here, and, and here's another one about women. They, these women, even though we read about them here at the crucifixion, it, and it, it alludes to it here in, this, in verse 41, these ladies weren't just, just new to the show. They didn't just show up for the crucifixion. These ladies had been there throughout Jesus' ministry, helping and assisting. Luke chapter 3 talks about it. 
I mean, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 8 talks about it, starting in verse 3. And, and just look at this. Just see this story of these women and how they helped out. It says, After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. So their ministry was vital for Jesus and the disciples. I mean, they were like the support team. I I can imagine that they made sure Jesus was fed. They made sure that they had a place to sleep. They all of these all of these details that are important to ministry that you have to have for ministry. These ladies took care of. It says one of them worked in Herod's household. She probably had money. She she financially was able to support them and keep them going from town to town and and just doing an important critical job in ministry and and just 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 thinking about this guys that when we think of ministry a lot of times when you ask people what what about ministry they said well that's just the preacher the preacher preaching and this is just one of many examples that ministry is is a lot further a lot broader than just the preacher preaching. I mean, it's it's a support ministry. It's it's a lot of different things to make sure ministry is going on. So they they took care of all the side details just to make sure that Jesus and the disciples were able to go and and do their thing, do their ministry. And it, where we read when we read in the stories about Jesus and the disciples, guys, we can we can imagine and it and it is clear right here that hey these li- these ladies weren't far away they were supporting they were helping they were they were right there so guys just understand that that god has equipped all of us for ministry guys we we all have a part in ministry and we should be involved do you hear me it, whether it's supporting the pastor whether it's supporting the staff whether it's keeping the church clean, whether it's a financial thing, whatever it is, guys, if God calls us and has equipped us to do it, if we we're, if we're truly identify ourselves as a Christian, as a child of the king, guys, we got to be doing stuff. we got to be in ministry, right? And these ladies, again, this scripture here in Mark's gospel alludes to the fact that the death of Jesus alludes to the fact that these ladies weren't just just casually or mailing it in or just doing it whenever they thought thought about doing it or whenever they just felt like it. It says in verse 41, In Galilee these women had followed and cared for his needs. So this was not, to, to look up the original language of, of this sentence here, these ladies didn't just sporadically, whenever they had a whim to do it, help Jesus and help the disciples and support it. I mean, they were they were a continued presence, and they had they had continued service to God. They were working hard. They they their ministry was critical. Women's ministry is critical, guys. All ministry is critical. So I just want you to understand this to to end up this service today that it's just a challenge to you. What do you do for the kingdom of God? What ministry do you do do to help the kingdom of God? Well, will you say, I I pray. And and some of you, maybe if you're older or whatever and have physical limitations, yeah, I, I get that. But I'm guessing, well, I don't guess. I know that for for most Christians, sad to say, that it's a sporadic event. That it's, you know, whenever I feel like it, whenever I feel like going to church, whenever I feel like doing something for the kingdom, I do it. But we learn from the example of these ladies here. They they were all in. They did everything they can to help out the kingdom. And they were there all the way to the end. You gotta commend them for that. Where the disciples had run away, most of the disciples had run away. 
A lot of the Jesus followers would run away. They were there. They were there. Even in tough times, they were there to support Jesus. Is, is that you guys? Just something to think about, right? God, God bless you. God bless you. Thank you for watching today. Please like and share. If you're on uh, YouTube, please, uh, please subscribe to our channel so that uh, more people can see it. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for j just, again, thinking about your death and, and your, your sacrifice for us, Lord. You're, you're the suffering servant. And, Lord, if it wasn't for you, we, we would have no hope. Lord, we thank you for what you your sacrifice on the cross. Lord, I thank you for the story of these women today. That, Lord, I'm so glad our denomination supports women or behind women who, 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 who just loves women and and what they do in ministry and supports them. Lord, I, I pray that we learn from these women today that that they just didn't do it on a whim, but Lord, that they that they served well, that they supported, they did whatever they needed to do, Lord, to help the ministry going forward. And Lord, I pray that's what we all do, that whatever it takes, Lord, whatever, whatever, whether it's financial, whether it's uh, just serving, whether it's whatever, Lord, just help us, Lord, to do what you've called us to do. Thank you, Lord, for this time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.